right, well, good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody today. My name is Brian. I'm the lead pastor, and uh, that was some worship, y'all. Man, that was some good stuff. Give it up for our team one more time. So proud of them. So proud of them. Um, but yeah, my name is Brian. I'm the lead pastor here. And our mission statement is that we exist to lead everyone to discover Jesus and follow him fully. And that we believe that everybody should have a one in their life. At least one person who you're praying for, trying to connect with, inviting to church, inviting to a relationship with Jesus so that they can discover who he is, follow him fully with their life, and then lead others to do the very same thing. So that's why we're here. We want to be there for you. And if you're joining us online, just hello. Glad you guys are with us here this morning. Chat host. Thank you so much. And they're going to be connecting with you guys throughout the service. Give them some like, give them some love. They're going to be there for you throughout our time together. Uh, before I dive in the message, though, I, I want to actually tell you about next week's new series that's starting. And you're like, wait, wait, wait. We're talking about this series. I know. It's going to be great. But we want to talk about next week also because it's going to be a great series. I want to give you a little teaser of what it's going to look like, and then I'll explain a little bit more. So take a quick look. Now, so next week, we're going to start a series that is called Simposco. And no, we are not inviting Chip and Joanna Gaines to be able to come, right? We don't have that budget, all right? So they're not coming. But it's, Simposco is going to be a study of the book of 2 Timothy. And we're going to be looking at it through a very unique lens, though. And as we unpack this book throughout this series, you're going to be hearing powerful stories of lives of real people that were, going to be, that were sitting around that table that you just saw there. And believe me, these are not the puppies and ponies, light, fluffy kind of stories. These are hard stories that are going to inspire you no matter what you're going through in your life right now. But through God's word in 2 Timothy and through those stories, you're going to see how God is, is going to walk through whatever you're going through, and he's going to do so in a way that lets you know that you're not alone. So I want you to invite your one. I want you to come and join uh, us next week as we begin this series. And so I'll challenge you to invite somebody to church, and we're going to help you out to do that. We've created some small little invite cards that you can grab. They're, uh, they're an easy thing to do. They include our service time, our website in the back, all that good stuff. You can find them at the Next Step kiosk or as you you exit today. We'll also help you if you're joining us online for those. But we'd again like you to invite your one to be a part of it. And they're handy. You kind of put them in your pocket, hand them to people. Now, listen, although they kind of look like it, they are not throwing stars that you whip at people in the name of Jesus and then walk away, okay? It's not like, hey, come to church. Wah-pa! Like, uh, like, nothing like that, okay? So don't be weird. Please don't be weird. Hand it to somebody. Be intentional. Say, hey, join me for church. I'll buy you lunch. Yeah. I'm going the next level, right? Just say, come and join me, be a part of it. I'm not buying, you're buying, right? You're gonna invite them to lunch to next week and I'd love for you to do that, okay? So anyway, I'm stoked about today because the reason is, is I think that this message is one of those messages that everybody needs to hear. Now, go, don't get me wrong. I want you to hear and listen to all the messages. I work really hard on these things, okay? So, why not? And I'm sure somebody's like, is there like a spreadsheet where I can know the ones not to have to listen to? Because I'd love to know that. There isn't one. Listen to them all. Stop being mean, okay? So, but I'm telling you, this one, all jokes aside, today I think this is one of those messages that all of us will pull something away from it. And here's why. Because the identity that we'll talk about today is either right now happening or will affect you at some point in your life. And, and we're at the, the closing end of this identity series. And, and we're looking and trying to really answer this, this idea of how in the world do I find my identity? How does, how does my occupational identity steal my true identity in God? And we're going to wrestle with what happens when what we do becomes who we think that we are. And that really is the ultimate question of this whole series, because we've been trying to answer this one question this whole time. Who am I? That's the question we're trying to answer. Who am I? And honestly, it's a really important question to answer, because if you think about it, how you answer this question will affect all kinds of areas of your life. It's going to affect how you think of yourself, how you think others, how you treat others, how you make decisions, and especially how you view God. Those are really important questions, big decisions that you are going to make in your life that all hinge on the answer to this question of who am I? And the world, oh my goodness, the world has a, has a plethora of things for you to choose from, for you to be able to have your identity found in that. And, and if you really look deep in it, people love to have different identities, 
right? They just love to do it. Like, for instance, Comic-Con. Okay, Comic-Con. 130,000 people come to San Diego once a year. You can see upcoming movies, your famous actors, but you can dress up like any character that you want, kind of like cosplay, that's kind of what it is, like where you, you dress up as an anime character, or a superhero, a video game character, whatever. Now, there's also the metaverse that's now. So the metaverse, it's a total universe where you can be anybody that you want, any sort of avatar. Like, I could have the best hair in the whole metaverse if I wanted to. Because right, I have this alternate identity, and it's really appealing to people because you don't have to be who you are. You can be somebody else. So the search for identity, it's constant and it's totally ongoing in every phase of our life, which is why so many people are in an identity crisis. We will bounce from identity to identity, hoping that maybe this one will stick and maybe this one will give me some peace and I'll feel accepted and I'll feel the comfort that I'm looking for. But time and time and time again, we find out that whatever the world is offering us will never satisfy the deep desires that we have in our life. And this is why we need to listen to what Jesus says in John 15, 19, which is acted as the grounding verse for this entire series. There Jesus says, if you belong to the world, it will love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you, he says. So this is really why it is so important for us to wrestle with this series. It's so important for us to wrestle with this series because we need to shed some light on what the world offers compared to what God offers. Or at the very least, provide you an opportunity to know that there's an alternative to what the world tells you. So we've already tackled a couple of the biggest identities that really look to def that people look to define themselves by. Week, week two, we looked at sexual identity. Last week, we looked at political identity. So when we find our identity in our sexuality or the politics that we support, and if you missed either of those messages, I would, man, I'd highly recommend you go back online. You can even go to the Crossroads Grace app and you can find them all there. I'd really love for you to listen to those. But, but the one that we're gonna look at today, occupational identity, it's a big one. It's a big one. And in a minute, we're gonna be in Colossians chapter three. So if you have your Bibles or your Crossroads Grace apps, open those to Colossians chapter three. We'll be there in just a second. Um, host, if you wouldn't mind, put the link in for my Crossroads Online family. We'd love for you to do that. But, but this identity, this occupational identity is really hard, hard to navigate. And, it, and it's hard not to get caught up in what you do. But what I mean is that what you do for a living or for your occupation sometimes becomes the subtitle of your life. Can you relate to this? Like, hi, my name is Brian. I am a pastor. Or maybe it's like, hey, I'm Tiffany, and I'm a stay-at-home mom. Or my name is Chris, and I'm a computer programmer in the Silicon Valley. Or hi, my name is Katie, and I'm an almond farmer, or almond farmer, or... Almond farmer, I don't know, right? I'm from South Dakota, I don't know, what, almonds, what I do, okay? But we'll, we'll attach what we do to who we are, and it begins to graft itself to us, not just to our paycheck, but to our identity. But it's really hard not to get caught up in what you do for a living. Did, did you know that we're gonna spend 90,000 hours of our life working? It's a long time to do anything. So it's, it's not surprising that who we are gets wrapped up in what we do. But I would tell you that it's okay to love what you do. I love what I get to do. Um, but where we get in trouble is when, when what our, our, our love of our occupation, it starts to tip toward defining us. That's, that's where there's an issue. So if we start to feel like we're better than someone else um, for what we do or maybe what we make as a result of our job, we run the risk of losing our identity. Or when we look down on other people for what they do in comparison to what we do, that's created a false identity. When we are not able to disconnect what we do for a living from who we are, again, that's a recipe for disaster. And guys, I said this in week one, but when I finally took off my, my baseball jersey when I was playing pro ball for a little bit, like the last time, man, I'll tell you what, I was lost for seven years. I was no longer baseball Brian, but I was simply only Brian, and that was really, really hard because I had wrapped up who I was with, with what I did. But, but check this out. D did you know that, that when I left that baseball stadium for the last time, there was no statue made for me? I mean, <laughs> right? Yeah. 
I, and I, they didn't retire my number. I, I don't even know if they remember me, really. Like, the organization moved on, but then I was left to pick up the pieces of my broken identity on the side of the road. So, so I, I want us to chew on this idea a little bit more today especially as we tackle this idea of occupational identity. I want you to think about this. That, that when we, go ahead and put that up there for me, guys. Maybe, yeah, when what you do becomes who you are, you've lost sight of what you were meant to be. I'll read it one more time. When what you do becomes who you are, you've lost sight of what you were meant to be. Your identity can never be found in your occupation. Do you know why? Because you won't have your job forever. But, 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 do you, but do you know what you will have forever? You. You will always be you forever. I know it's crazy, but, but it's true. You'll always be you. No matter what you, you will always be you. So here's the thing. What happens, what happens when you attach your identity to who you are like a parachute in your life, and then what happens when that parachute flies away? What happens when the kids leave for college or they get married? What happens when they say, you know what, we're going to need to downsize the company even though you've worked there 30 years? What happens when you become injured and you can't play anymore? What happens in that moment is that you're left to navigate the free fall of life, the gravity of life without your parachute because that head that was with your identity, it's all gone now. And, and here's the deal. Our jobs, guys, our jobs, our jobs, our job, told you. Our jobs are not meant to be our life, but to be part of our life. Not to be our life, but to be part of our life. But, but the key to not being sucked into this vortex of what you do defining who you are is to keep the right perspective and as believers in Jesus to stay focused on him. Because our job is not who we are. It's a means to do what God has designed us to do. That's what they are. And we're gonna get more into that in detail in just a second, but there are a couple of things that I wanna kind of clear up because I'm guessing that there's a little bit maybe stirring in your spirit right now and you're like, uh, so let me clear some things up. First thing is, you were made, most assuredly, God made you to work and to work hard. Think about what Solomon says, Proverbs 12, he says, diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. I, I think that as a culture, we've, we've, we've all got, like there's a cultural allergy that I see people coming down with over the past few years, and, and no amount of flonase is, is helping it, okay? Not at all, all right? I believe that when I moved into Central Valley that it should be sponsored by Claritin and flonase because <laughs> what are we doing? Anyway, okay, right, but there's this, there's this allergy that's come over, and it, it's debilitating. It's a debilitating disease because people have become allergic to hard work. Yeah, we have become entitled into thinking that it is someone else's job to take care of me. Don't believe me? Here's an example. I saw recently where a young girl sued her parents. Now, why, you might ask, for this. For giving birth to her. No joke, yeah, yeah. Why? because she didn't ask them to do so. <laughs> and it gets better, hang tight, we're not even at the punchline yet, right? And so she sued them because she wanted them to pay her $5,000 a month for the rest of her life so she didn't have to work because she was, didn't ask to be born. And she won, right? That's being appealed and all that kind of stuff. That's real, I got a website, I got a thing and everything, right? But I think this young girl may have been who Solomon was speaking about when he says in Proverbs 12, 11, those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies will have no sense. <laughs> Read your Bible. It's fantastic, right? <laughs> Thinking that we don't have to work is a fantasy. So it is good to work hard. Paul would tell it straight away, 1 Corinthians, he says, we work hard with our own hands. Case closed. So it's good to be challenged, it's good to work hard, it's good to go above and beyond, it's good to be passionate about what you do, it's even good to love what you do, as we said. Which brings me to the second thing that I want us to understand. There is a difference between identity and pride. Now, I want you to be careful, I'm not talking about pride that leads you to sin. Okay, the first service, somebody asked me about that, not sin, but having pride in what you do, there's a way for it to be a good thing. 
In fact, it's what separates the average worker from the great worker, the average athlete from the great athlete, the average student from the great student. Pride is what will drive you to go back to school so you can do better at your job. It makes you, wanna, it makes you want to like stay up late so things are the right way. It makes you get excited when someone is pleased with what you've done at your job. It, it, it makes, pride makes you unashamed of telling someone what you do for a living. Guys, Pride that doesn't flip toward arrogance or narcissism, that sinful side, I think it's a healthy motivator to do the very best that you can in whatever you do. So I think that we should take pride in what we do. I I want you to know, my team here at Crossroads, man, we take pride in bringing excellence to everything we do each and every week and each and every area that we do. I'll give you a case in point of this. Last night we had the the gala that was here, the Modesto Gospel Mission Gala, Wren Collective concert was unbelievable. It was so cool to support uh, the Modesto Gospel Mission. But when everybody left, there were basically was one guy that was left to put everything back to get ready for Sunday. His name is Brian Lennon. He's our technical director behind the scenes and he stayed here to like, I don't know, now to be able to get everything ready to go because he has pride in what he does. So would you give it up for Brian just for a second? Love Brian. Love you, Brian. Love you, man. But you will never know how much work goes into just even one service, even a one lesson, even a one thing that happens here. And why? Because we want to give God glory for what we do. It's not about us. But we take pride in what we've been called to do. So, so God-centered pride, not sinful pride, God-centered pride can be a good thing. But there is a very important balance that has to be struck. Because it's the way in which we work and the reason why we work that's so crucial. Because we don't work to be defined by what we do. We work because of the one who gave us all that we have. That's why we work. And and let me explain this a little bit more. Again, turn over to Colossians chapter three, verse 17. That's where we're gonna be at. I'm gonna unpack that verse a little bit with us today. So in Colossians chapter three, verse 17. Um, And what you're gonna find is that in Colossians three, Apostle Paul is writing to this church in a city called Colossae. Good church, things are going really great there, but he's addressing in this letter, in chapter three specifically, what Christ-centered living looks like as you read through it. But in the middle of it, he kind of pushes pause, and all of a sudden he brings in these words in Colossians 3, verse 17. He would say it this way. He would say, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So what this would seem is this is like little kind of shot in the arm, you know, like, hey, work hard, stay on focus, you know, all this kind of good stuff, it would make sense. But in reality, there's a whole lot more there. Because in this one verse that we see here, there are implications for our entire life that might take an entire lifetime to fully understand what he was just saying. Now, I, I know we don't have a lifetime to be able to unpack all that today because Well, the Raiders are playing right now at 10, so I get that. And uh, the Niners play at 520 tonight, and we all need to pray that Jimmy G is the Jimmy G of today and not Jimmy G of last year. Right? Can we all say, okay, we good? I'm a Bengal fan. I'm 0-2. I'm barely hanging on. Okay, so I'm fine and stuff. So, but but, but let's look at a few things in this verse. Not we don't have to look at the whole thing, but let's look at a few things that I believe as we look at, it's going to give you some great detail about identity in your life and my life today. First thing, first phrase that we see, Paul says, in whatever you do. Now, this word whatever is super important to understand. The word whatever in the Greek is this word pause, pause. And and what this means, and what pause means, it means every, and it also means all. So every and all. And it's the only time in the Bible that this little Greek word is used for the word whatever. It's found in Colossians 3. So Paul is very, very careful about choosing this word, this word pause, Because the fact that Paul says whatever or every or all is really important. Because what we do in our life is not always about the job that we go to in an office, is it? Whatever we do could be, I'm a stay-at-home mom or dad. Or maybe your whatever is your, my, my daughter's travel soccer coach. Or you're a mom, a dad, a grandma, a grandpa. You're a wife, you're a husband, you're a what, fill in the blank. All of it counts And all of it could have the tendency to steal our identity if we're not careful. So this means there's no such thing as a, oh, I'm just a fill in the blank. Paul is saying that whatever, what what all you do, all of it, it, it it all counts. But then he goes on even one step further to explain this a little bit more in the rest of it. He says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, 
And the reason he says this is to complete kind of the, the allness idea that he had started. He says that it's not just our actions, but it's also our words that are part of the whatever when it comes to your identity. Because isn't this true, guys? Isn't it true? We can say, oh, we're good at this. We say our identity is in Jesus. We can say our hope is in him and him alone. We can say that we hold our job and our status and our everything else really loosely. We could say that, but boy, our actions speak the opposite, don't they? We act as though we are more concerned about what somebody else says than Jesus. We act as though our hope and our security is in our 401k and our job security. We act as though the title and the success in our life is preeminent in our life. So our words don't match our actions. Now, the other thing is true also, that we can, we can act one way in front of our Christian friends and we say, Jesus is number one. But in our inner dialogue, maybe our conversation with friends, we say it completely the other way. We'll put our hands up and worship. God, I'm with you. Jesus, I'm with you. I love you. I love you. Only to walk out of this room, grab our cell phone, tell our boss that we'll, we'll be in a little bit later and I'll skip my growth group and I'll miss my, my time with my family. We act like we're so good at being like a stay-at-home parent. Like, yes, I'm good. I love it. It's so good. But then when we talk with our friends, we say that we're, we don't feel like we're enough without a job. It happens over and over. Paul says that all that we say and all that we do matters. And it needs to be in alignment with what comes to our identity. But, but here's how we do that. Look closely again. He says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So, so can you see how this happens? The, the way that we keep our whatever we do in the right order is that we do it all in the name of Jesus. Now, interesting stuff, whatever in all, it's, again, the same word, pause, same word, pause, that's there that he's using. It's a very interesting word. So, so this is now much more powerful when you consider, consider it, especially if you read it, because what we so often do when we read the Bible is we just read the words, but we don't ever really chew on what they mean. And if we do that, what we might do is we might have a tendency to say, well, whatever we do, whether in word or deed, we do everything, we should do it for Jesus, and that seems really holy and right, doesn't it? But it's not actually what it says here. It says that we do all, whatever, pause, in the name of Jesus. That it's in the name of Jesus that we do whatever we do. And that is exponentially more powerful than just doing things for Jesus. Because just consider what it means to do something in the name of Jesus. Let me start right here. Jesus actually says that when believers get together uh, in his name, he says he's with us. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus would say, for where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. So that means right now in this room, online, all together, since we are in this room together, Jesus is here with us. That's pretty cool, right? Now, if you think that's great, check this out. And when Jesus sends out the 72 disciples in, in, the, in the Gospels, he sends them out in pairs, says, go out and tell the world about this kingdom of God that's coming. Take a look at what happens when they return in Luke chapter 10. It says, then the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So in the name of Jesus, Satan and his demons shudder and they submit to him. Darkness flees in the name of Jesus. When Peter and John, in Acts chapter 3, they come up to this blind beggar who had been blind since birth, and the beggar asked them for money, listen to what Peter tells them. He says, then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And when the religious leaders, they catch wind of what Peter and John had just done, they throw them in front of the, 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 the ruling council because they were in trouble, and they ask him this question. They say, by what power or what name did you do this? And listen to what they say. They say, it is by the, the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. My friends, can you see this? The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, all in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus, sickness, disease, and death have all met their match because there is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, oh and, and, and lest we forget, look in Acts chapter 4. It says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. 
So in the name of Jesus, sin is destroyed, salvation is assured, and forgiveness is given. And, and, and although this might be true for the believer that we believe this, did you know that at one time, and at one point, every person will believe this on earth as well? Paul tells us, Philippians chapter 2, he says that at the, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Imagine this for a second, that one day that even uttering the name of Jesus, every person will not be able to keep themselves from kneeling down in front of him. That at the majesty of Jesus, King Jesus, the world will bow in honor of his power and his authority and his reverence and his holiness. My friends, can you see it that there is power in the name of Jesus? And when that happens, things happen in his name. So, so again, I ask you to consider what Paul just wrote here. He says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. Because now that means so much more, doesn't it? That he is saying that in the name that heals and saves and forgives and rules and reigns, in that name we should do whatever we do in his name. Anything that we do should be done in the name of Jesus. And as I thought about this, I realized something. I realized that when we try to find our identity in what we do, something has happened that we might not be aware of. That either intentionally or unintentionally, by placing our identity in our job or what we are or who we are, we are saying that our name is more important than his name. Think about it. Don't you say, it's my job, my future, my spouse, my sexuality, my political party, my family. It's all about me, and it's about my name. But the problem is that our name cannot hold a candle to his. Our name cannot because it is not, will it ever be as powerful as his. But yet as followers of Jesus, we are to do whatever we do in his name, the name that has power, the name that has healing, the name that has identity. That's what we do everything in, which should tell us that our identity should never be about our name, but always about the name of Jesus. And, and here's the way that we do this, though. Paul continues, Colossians 3.17, the end of it, he says, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The way that we can avoid making our name greater than his name is by doing all that we do by his name, by being thankful. We work, we live with a mindset of giving thanks to God, not for our jobs to be able to define us, but by him. And did you know that thankfulness, it's rooted in worship. It's in being grateful and aware of what Jesus did for us, which then in turn reminds us why his name is greater than our name. It's about our worship. It's about adjusting the focus of our life and why we do anything. Because identity is not about occupation. It's about our adoration. It's, identity is about like, who we worship the most. Do we worship ourselves, or do we worship Jesus? Do we worship our job or Jesus? Do we worship our GPA or Jesus? Do we worship our stats on the field or on the court or Jesus? Do we worship the following we have on social media or Jesus? Do we worship the fact that we're in a relationship or not in a relationship or married or have kids or not have kids or Jesus? Do we worship our politics or Jesus? Do we worship our kids in their athletic accomplishments or Jesus? And my hand is in the air because my goodness, is that easy for me? Man, I love my kids so much and it becomes so easy to be, become, you know, Easton when he's playing good in baseball. Man, I feel so much better about myself. Or when my daughter is playing great in volleyball, oh man, it can be, I feel so much, so man, I am, I am not immune to that at all. Guys, we have to realize that what we do is more than our nine to five because we are loved by God 24-7. We have to. 
Because who we are is who he says that we are. Who we are is who God says we are. So every week we try to give you something to maybe wrestle with and maybe a couple things you can think about this week. Maybe you need to memorize Colossians 3.17. Let's make that part of what you do this week. Maybe, maybe the second thing is that before you start your day, pray to put God's name before your name. Before you even hit the ground, God, I want your name great, not my name. Or maybe the final thing is maybe just invite your one to church next week. Be bold, invite them to church. Be part of this Impossible series. But whatever this might be, if you go on the app, you can uh, click on whichever one you choose to be a part of. Again, it helps to be able to help you keep accountable, but I pray that you do something with it. But I'm not sure how this series has hit you, this whole identity series. I'm not sure what God's been doing in your life. I know he's been doing some stuff in mine. But what I do pray more than anything is I pray that, that there was some heart work that was done. Not, not hard work, we've talked about that. Hard work is about what we do in order to accomplish something. Heart work is what only Jesus can do in our heart. And that maybe we were able to take a long look at who we really think that we are and then ask this hard question of where is God in that reflection? Because no matter how young you are, old you are, rich or poor, at some point in this life, you'll have faced an identity crisis. And the question is really whose voice are you gonna listen to in that moment? Will you listen to the world screaming at you with so many other options of what you should have and what you deserve and what will make you feel right? Or will you listen to the gentle whisper of God who's just saying, you are who I say that you are? And the choice, guys, it's, it's up to us what we choose. But I will tell you this. When we finally rest in our identity being found in God and what he says, who says, he says that we are, we're actually able to find confidence. And confidence in this, that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Consider Paul's words, Romans chapter eight. And there he says this, he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it's written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God says that when we are found in Jesus, when we are defined by his name, nothing can separate us from his love. I mean, nothing can separate us from him. Not your past mistakes, not your hurtful words towards your other, other people, not how much or little you make not the size of your house, not your political party, not your sexual identity. He says nothing can separate God's love from us when Jesus is the Lord and Savior of your life. So if that's true, why would we ever choose an identity that would try to separate us from God? Any identity other than the one that's found in him is trying to do just that. When our identity is found in Christ, we have comfort, we have confidence, we have a consistency in this life that is unmatched because every other identity is about pulling you away from God, about keeping you from Him, about making your name great and not His. But our true identity should never be about our name, but always about the name of Jesus.
So we take this moment to remember Jesus through this time of communion, to remember that amazing grace, the fact that our chains are gone because of him and only because of him. And so each week we come to this point where we get to reflect on Christ and I pray that you would make a reflection of Christ, of how much he's in your reflection, how much your identity is found in him or how much it's found in all the other stuff in this world. And until when you look in that mirror, you see Jesus, you'll always be left not longing. But when you see him, you start to see that you can begin to live. This bread represents the bread of life, Jesus Christ. Let's take and eat in remembrance of him. And this juice represents the shed blood of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of our sins, we take and drink in remembrance of him now. All right, well, before I pray and close us out, I just hope that if there's any questions that you have, if you want to know more about Jesus, our team would love to talk with you at our kiosk in the lobby, the chat host online. Also, we just tell you that if it's the end of the month, so this is a time for benevolence. If you'd like to give just a little bit more, helps those in need around our community as you exit today. But the other thing I just want to remind you of is that you are loved. God loves you so much that he gave his son for you. Live your life with that identity and you'll start living life to the full. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for right now for my friends around the country, around the world, those here in Manteca and beyond. God, I just pray that you would be with us and let our lives be identified with you and you alone because in you is found life. In you is found what we're looking for, completeness, wholeness, purpose. And I pray that we would do that, not by our strength, but by yours, and that whatever we do, we would do it in your name because in your name is power. In your name is victory. In your name, our chains are gone. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. Be with us now as we leave. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, God bless you guys. Have a great week. Tag your it.